So in the beginning, I shared everything that happened with that lead site and how I did things and what I wish I had done differently and what I learned. And now I've since then built several different new businesses on the site showing people how I'm doing it, what I'm doing, why I'm making these decisions, why I shouldn't have made certain decisions because it doesn't always go well. Uh, but it's always a lesson, and that, that's the coolest part about it, and that's why I sort of call myself the crash test dummy of online business because <laughs> I'm not afraid to put myself out there, you know, and, right. and oh, even the bad stuff. And, and, and by sharing all of me, people know the real me, and as a result of that, I've been able to build a great relationship with an amazing community. On this bonus episode of the Her Power Hustle, we are talking with Mr. Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income, the podcast, the website, the movement, the lifestyle. Let's go. You're listening to Her Power Hustle, the show where inspiration meets motivation to empower women for the perspiration associated with being a woman entrepreneur. I'm your host, Michelle Talbert. This is bonus episode 11. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. As I said, I'm Michelle Talbert. This is Her Power Hustle, the podcast. And we are talking today with Mr. Pat Flynn, the founder and host of Smart Passive Income. We are talking about fear. We're talking about the road less traveled, how our paths may have crossed in the past and how our paths will cross in the future. And hopefully all in between there, you'll get some little nuggets about overcoming fear if you have any, about the benefits of being a podcaster and really taking an opportunity to blaze a trail. But if you're blazing a trail, how do you find folks to help you along the way if you're doing something no one else has ever done? We talk about that and so much more. I really think if you're not already familiar with Pat, you're going to fall in love with him like the rest of us have in terms of his transparency and the great information he shares. I'm excited you're here because I've been gone for three weeks and I appreciate those of you who have reached out to say what's going on. And let me tell you, it has felt like I lost an appendage. My laptop got struck with the nastiest of viruses by Rye. Um, and it just debilitated me. I was using my iPad and I was using my cell phone and I was still conducting interviews here and there. Actually, Pat was the last interview. Fortunately, I had already cleared the decks thinking, okay, I have a lot of content. I'm going to be able to push this out and, um, focus on some other parts of my business and just edit the great interviews that I've already done. And my laptop said, no, honey, you might have that plan, but yeah, you're going to have to figure something else out. So fortunately, I got it back. The files are all intact, thankfully, because of course, I'd backed up some, but not all. So that might be a word to the wise there. But at any rate, I'm just really happy to be back, back on the air. I have so much great content. So we are going to move to twice a week, just so that you have options and opportunity to get really great information. We have interviews coming up with Donald Kelly, the sales evangelist, and Suzanne Moore talking about developing your list and the importance of newsletters and just so much more content. But I wanted to take a moment just to say thank you for hanging in there, for waiting for me to come back. Um, I hope you were able to listen to prior episodes that have been recorded and get ready, get ready, get ready, because we have some really great information coming your way. Additionally, we have the Facebook book group we have launched sister power hustlers if you are a sister power hustler and you are not in the facebook group please be sure to join you can sign up at herpowerhustle.com slash facebook and also we are doing a giveaway for the next week where you can win free curl kits from dr miracles and at the end of the week Next week following, I will be announcing the grand prize winner who gets a basket from Diana Delivers. And you get uh, financial analysis from Ascension Wealth. And you get free hair care products for a year from Dr. Miracles along with some other goodies. So I'm very excited about this opportunity to share this amazing gift with our sister power hustlers. Thanks to our sponsors. So be sure to sign up there at herpowerhustle.com slash winning. You have to be signed up to be eligible to win. So without further ado, I want to head into our amazing discussion with Mr. Pat Flynn, the podcaster of all podcasters, the, you know, the, the ambassador of 
not just passive income, but smart passive income. And by passive income, we mean that money that comes in while you're asleep, while you're on the beach. It really can come true. Doesn't mean there isn't hard work involved, and he's going to talk about that. But it does mean that once you get your systems in place, your processes in place, that you will be in a position to have income coming in while you then can work on other things. And we do talk about being a multi-passionate entrepreneur. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts after the show. I'm going to just stop in and drop a little bit more information. And I look forward to connecting with you again in our exclusive Facebook group and for you to sign up to win, win, win herpowerhustle.com slash winning. Welcome back to Her Power Hustle. This is Michelle Talbert. I am here with Pat Flynn. I'm not going to say I'm excited because I always say I'm excited, even though I am beyond excited right now for this conversation. I am so excited. <laughs> See, I couldn't stop myself anyway. I'm so excited to bring Pat Flynn to you because he is a father, husband, and online serial entrepreneur who shares his business experience across several markets on smartpassiveincome.com, his blog, his top-rated podcast, and video show. He's known for his authenticity and transparency, and we're definitely going to talk about his transparency today, sharing every detail of his online business ventures along the way, wins, failures, his, his actual, you know, trepidation with public speaking not too long ago, and even how much he makes and where it comes from on his monthly income report. He's also a best-selling author, keynote speaker, he's been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, New York Times, and... I hear tell, and actually I've seen the tape, he's been known to travel via DeLorean, a la Back to the Future. Mr. Pastelin, welcome to Her Power Hustle. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate you putting the DeLorean in that intro for me. I, I always appreciate that. <laughs> I know. you got to love it. I mean, come on now. I mean, we all love Back to the Future, and you just tapped right into that moment and took us all right back there. So we were at the mall and everything. I mean, it was just great. Thank you so much for being here and being so creative, which is some of what we're going to talk a little bit about. Yeah, Before, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. Anything I could do to help you and your audience, I am here for you. Thank you so much. Well, we have a rabid community of sister power hustler entrepreneurs and some brother entrepreneurs, too. Um, so I want to just get into a little bit about your background. So you're going along, you're an architect, and 2009, 2010, what happened? Well, actually, I graduated from architecture school in Berkeley in 2005, and then I was had a great job March of 2008. I had gotten engaged, uh, and uh, everything was great. You know, I had just gotten promoted at the time as well. June 2008, get called into my boss's office, and he goes, hey, Pat, you know, why don't you sit down? So I sit down, and he goes, Pat, you're one of the youngest, brightest guys we know. Unfortunately, we have to let you go, mm. which was like the worst thing in the world because I didn't have a plan B. I had this whole vision of the future of me becoming this world-renowned architect at the age of 60 and having my own firm and like all this stuff. I was dedicated to the world of architecture. My first reaction was actually – when I got back to my desk was I called every single architecture firm that I've ever worked with, ever knew, all my friends back in architecture school, every contractor we've ever worked with, and begged and pleaded for a job. And nobody was hiring at the time. If you might remember, that, that was when the crash happened, and nobody was hiring. Nobody was building buildings, so nobody needed any designers. So I was kind of you know, made redundant at that time. Um, but I got, I got really lucky in the, in the way kind of the events worked out after that because it was – Three months until I was technically going to be officially let go. So I was still coming into work just to make the few extra dollars. I moved back in with my family, um, my mom and dad, and my uh, my fiance moved back in with hers because we were saving money for the wedding. So again, struggling at this time, not really knowing what was going to happen next. And it was I was taking the train from San Diego to Irvine, California, which is about a two hour train ride. And I got bored with music, so I started listening to podcasts. And I discovered this one podcast where I heard an interview with a guy who was talking about how he was making six figures, passing or helping people pass the project management exam or the PM exam. And that's when a light bulb went off for me because I had passed this really hard exam in the architecture industry called the lead exam. And to help me pass this exam, I actually created a blog to help me keep track of my notes and it allowed me to share my notes with a few of my coworkers and stuff. But after I passed that exam, I had no need for it anymore. So it was just sitting there for a long time. But then I was like, you know, I have this site. Maybe I could go back to it and maybe I can turn this into a business helping other people. I mean, what have I got to lose? So I went back to the site. I put a tool on the site to help keep a traffic, keep track of traffic because I never had no need to keep track of it before. And I discovered that the next day 
But there were literally five to 6,000 p- different people from around the world coming to, to my site every single day already wow. looking to pass this exam and looking for information on how to do that. And it freaked me out. I was so scared. That was my first reaction. I was like, really? I, I had no idea why or how that was happening. But eventually I found out that there were a few things that were happening. I'd written so much content on there, and it was up there for a long time, that Google put it up really high in the search engines for, for uh, keywords related to industry. And then I noticed that there was a lot of traffic coming from other websites. So a lot of people in the architecture world uh, who had some influence discovered this site and started sharing it with their people. And I had no idea. Like it became this like underground lead exam website thing and that nobody knew who was in charge of. But it was like it was me. And then right. it was at that point I was like, oh, gosh, like, OK, l- let me see if I can help these people. And I put my face on the side. I opened up the comments and people started asking me questions. And I didn't know the answers to all the questions, but I, I knew about the exam. I had taken it. I had passed. I didn't get a perfect score, so I still had to look up answers to questions at, at some point. Uh, at some points, but I was seen as the expert in that industry because I was the one up online, because I was the one who had already taken the exam. And then it became apparent to me that I could publish a book, a study guide to help these people pass this exam, taking all this content that was on this website, chunking it down, and turning it into this really clear step-by-step guide to help people pass this exam. And I launched that guide in October of 2008, which was the exact same month that I officially got let go. And in that month, I had generated from a $19.99 ebook $7,908.55. Oh. And it completely changed my life. It completely changed my view of online business because my whole thought of online business beforehand was you know, red alert, red alert, scam alert. This guy's just trying to take my money. Um, right. and, then, and then here he was doing it and doing it in such a legit way, kind of just getting accidentally put into it, even though I know that I had put in a lot of work up front because – while I was still working, I had spent a lot of time on that site every single day. So I was, as I'm telling this story, I don't want people to think like this just happened overnight because it was definitely the opposite of that. But when I saw the opportunity, I definitely jumped on it, and I wrote this book, made a lot of money that first month. Money started rolling in even more. I built an audio book to go along with it that I sold alongside it or uh, buy it on itself, and that increased my income even more. So by the time March 2009 rolled around, I was making twenty five dollars to $30,000 a month off of this little ebook. And the coolest part about it was that people could purchase the book on the site and get it delivered to them automatically via email without me having to lift a finger. So it was all done passively because it was all set up up front. And so people could come to the site, get what they needed, and all I had to have to do is sit back and worry about getting more people to the site or watching my PayPal accounts uh, grow, um, right. which, is, which is the coolest thing. That's where this whole idea of passive income came from. And what that enabled me to do in terms of spending all that extra time that I wasn't working on my business, but that the fact that that business was working for me, it allowed me to do these other things like create smartpassiveincome.com, which is the site where most people know me from now, which I, like you so awesomely mentioned in the beginning, is where I share everything that has happened. So in the beginning, I shared everything that happened with that lead site and how I did things and what I wish I had done differently and what I learned. And now I've since then built several different new businesses on the site showing people how I'm doing it, what I'm doing, why I'm making these decisions, why I shouldn't have made certain decisions because it doesn't always go well. Uh, but it's always a lesson, and that, that's the coolest part about it, and that's why I sort of call myself the crash test dummy of online business because <laughs> I'm not afraid to put myself out there, you know, and, right. and oh, even the bad stuff. And, and, and by sharing all of me, people know the real me, and as a result of that, I've been able to build a great relationship with an amazing community um, just like you've been able to build a, a, an amazing relationship with yours. And um, now, like I said, I'm doing these keynote speeches, and you know, beyond that, I'm 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 doing I'm I'm spending more time with my family, um, right. and, and 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 I'm doing all these other cool things. Like uh, last last year for my birthday, I decided to run this cool campaign to help build schools in Ghana, in yeah. Africa, and uh, we were able to raise as a community twenty eight thousand dollars. And I said that if we reached twenty five thousand, I would match twenty five thousand, and we did. So I was able to raise a total of about fifty five grand. And we were able to build two schools in Ghana, and I'm actually headed there in about two weeks to visit the schools, to visit the children. I'm bringing my video camera guy to film the whole thing uh, because I want to make sure people who donated to the campaign also get to see the work that they put into right. And that, that, and that speaks to your transparency. And so obviously our listeners who aren't yet familiar or weren't familiar with you realize how rich your experience is and how much you bring to the table. And for all of you folks, I definitely highly recommend that you check out Ash Pat and Smart Passive Income. And I think you have business breakthrough um, with Chris Zucker um, as yep. well. I'm probably saying that the name of the uh, podcast wrong. But all those links will be on herpowerhustle.com slash Pat Flynn. 
I'm only going to talk with Pat about one specific area because I really want to go deeply into this area. And the reason is Pat and I share a history, although we've never met or haven't met yet. We'll actually be meeting at Podcast Movement, where he will be keynoting, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> oh, that's, um, that'll be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. So Pat and I both started listening to Jason and Jeremy of Internet Business Mastery, which was a podcast that I used to, it's still a podcast, a podcast that I listened to back in 2009 after I left the law to go into real estate and then the real estate market tanked. Mm. So 2006, 2008, 2009, I start listening to these podcasts with these guys and it was amazing the information they were sharing about what they reported you could achieve online. And as Pat just mentioned, it's so difficult sometimes to put our guard down, to trust when someone is selling us something that honestly sounds too good to be true. But here's the difference. Pat actually, and I want you to talk a little bit about this, took the road less traveled. Pat actually worked with those guys. He is obviously one of their best students. I mean, we can safely say that this, you know, the student has become the teacher when it comes to online business mastery at this point. And I was afraid to invest in the course. So, Pat, you're here as a mentor to me and the community because I identified in you someone who was willing to take a risk on something when many of us, myself included, took the more travel path of, of, of keeping my money in my pocket and not winning in the long term. Mm, mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about your decision to actually work with Jason and Jeremy and more, more generally about taking a risk on something that you believe can ultimately benefit you and, and overcoming fear and doubt and disbelief. Yeah, you know, I got connected with Jer Jason and Jeremy. I had heard their podcast a few times uh, even before I got laid off, and it was just like, oh, that's cool, internet business. Like These guys uh, sound like they know what they're talking about, but I was never really interested. But then when I got laid off, I was like, okay, I'm listening to these guys all the time. Right. And, and I got to know them really well just through the power of their voice, and I had never met them before. I mean that's that's one thing, one good lesson is like just how amazing a podcast can be at actually – helping make a real connection with people. Um, but but then I started listening to them, and then they came out with this thing called the Academy. And, you know, it does cost mm -hmm. money to, 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 to do that. But I had built that relationship with them and that trust uh, into the information. I, a lot of the information they shared on the podcast for free was already completely helpful for me. I almost felt like I had to pay them back, and that was my mm -hmm. way of doing it. Um, and, and, you know, the law of reciprocity is there. When you give and you give and you give and you give, when you ask eventually after you've given so much, it's not much of an ask at all. And so when they came out with that academy, it seemed like the stars were aligned for me because that's exactly what I needed. Um, you know, they also had the guarantees into play as if I wasn't satisfied, you know, I can get my money back. So that was there to help. And that's obviously sort of part of marketing to include those type, that type of language there. Um, but, but I knew they were going to be helpful. I've also talked to a lot of people who were going into it as well, asking them, well, what do you guys feel about it? How do you think about this? I'm like, yeah, let's do this, let's do this together. Um, and, and that was really helpful as well. You know, if you go into things alone, oftentimes it's, it's hard to get a full view of everything. And um, it's really important to kind of connect with the same people who are doing the same things as you so that you can together help each other out. And that was something that became a very, very apparent in the group. And as, as great as the content in their program is, what really, really kept me going was the community that was surrounding that content the forums and all the people mm -hmm. that were active in there. And I made, I made great connections and friends with people who were in the same boat as I was when I first started out. And we started to help each other out. We actually ended up creating a mastermind group sort of informally in, on, on, on that, on that, uh, in that forum. And then what happened was Jeremy, I don't know if you remember this, he moved to San Diego and then I was in San, I, I was in San Diego. And then he said, Hey, if anybody is in San Diego, like let's meet at this restaurant and, and we'll hang out. We'll, we'll do a mastermind. And I was so scared to go that day, but I knew I had to do it because I wanted to, to ask questions. I wanted, I, kn I knew I needed help, and that was the big thing. I knew I needed help. Mm -hmm. We can't do this on your own. And, and, and yes, there are free resources out there. You can go on YouTube to pretty much learn anything you want now. Um, there are places out there that will help you do that. Like all that, all all information is free now. Like I feel like pretty much information is all, is just at our. If we want to search for it, we'll find it. What right. really you need to pay for is the fact that you're connecting with the right people, the right teachers, the right mentors, and the right community if there is a community involved. And that's that's really the benefit that I got out of joining was who and, I was connecting with. 
And I'm so glad that you said that both. I know that, you know, you have the mastermind with Jamie Cardi and David Allen and those folks, Mm -hmm. and you really all sort of get value. But, you know, for our listeners who may be listening and saying, well, I'm not a Jamie Cardi or David Allen or Pat Flynn's level, you know, how do I find community? How do I create community when I'm the sole entrepreneur? You know, I'm the person who everybody looks at kind of weird. Like, really? You just don't go to work and come home, you know? (laughs) I know that feeling. (laughs) Right. You know, we're weird. We're oddballs. And when you find your community of oddballs, it's awesome. But what are some of your suggestions for people finding their tribe of oddballs? I mean, you gotta you gotta just find out where they hang out. I mean, the, the, there's nothing more powerful now than going to conferences where where other people like you hang out and talk to them, and you get to meet them in person. You get to see their real personality. You get to shake their hands. You get to share a drink with them. You get to have coffee with them. You get to go to presentations with them. You get to make real connections. All the best relationships I have um, maybe started out online, but were really, really uh, brought forth when we've met in person at these different events. And there are events happening all the time. Like you and I are going to meet for the first time at Podcast Movement, and we're going to be even closer together, and that's going to be great. And who, uh, who knows what we're going to talk about or what can come out of that. It's going to be great. Um, right. So again, you know, so it, it, I think it was David Hooper who was a, um, a mu- he's a marketer in the music world and music industry who came on my podcast. He said because we were talking about how can how can bands get more exposure online, and and his answer was well by actually getting offline. And so mm-hmm. to, to to grow your brand online, you kind of have to get offline every once in a while and, and meet those people, not just your fans obviously, but also the people who are going to potentially be there to help support you and hold you accountable, the people who are going to be your mentors, whether that's official or not, they're going to be people who you can connect with who can inspire you to get to that next level uh, to, to where you want to go. And then in terms of your other question, you know, th- that risk that's involved, that parting with our money in order to do that, mm-hmm. like, you know, that my, my, my response to that is, you know, you could always make more money down the road. You know, time, however, that's something once you, once you lose, you never get back. And that's the big thing about these these products and courses. If you trust the person and you know and uh, that that they're going to help you, that's the biggest thing that it's going to save you. It's going to save you time. And you have to really think about okay, how much is your time worth? Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of people also when they think about this, the, like they they have a lot of reservations. That resistance comes into play. Uh, there's a great book out there by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. War of Art. Yeah, not the Art of War by Sun Tzu. That's a totally right. different book. The War of Art. <laughs> by Stephen Pressfield, who talks about this whole – that that inner voice that just tries to stop us every time we try to do something new. And, and it's so true. Everybody experiences that. But now you know, where I'm, in, where I'm at as an entrepreneur, I find that voice, and that voice helps guide me to where I need to go. I look for the fear, and that's where I need to go because that shows me that there's something amazing on the other end. There's always been something amazing on the other end. And you know, the question that a lot of us always ask ourselves when we try something new is, well, what if this doesn't work out? But I like to flip that, at least in my own eyes, and say, well, what if it does? Now, so folks, no, definitely, you are a master. Oh, I have to add to that. The Big Leap is a really great book, too. I'm actually listening to it right now on um, Audible, on audiobooks, mm. and it is great talking about your upper limit issue, that sometimes we hit success and we do something to self-sabotage right. as well. Like right. we go beyond our own comfort zone with regard to success, and that's a really um, good point as well. As someone who is actually a trailblazer, I know that, you know, Jason and Jeremy were integral to your building an online business, but in many ways you're a trailblazer. And when you're doing something that feels so different, how do you find mentors to mentor you along the way when you're blazing the trail? Yeah, that's a great question because when you're blazing the trail, you're you're on a trail that's never been blazed before. Yeah, um, right. So, I mean, really what, what, what has helped me through that is, I mean, few things internally. I know that I'm, I'm trying new things and that I have to be okay if I fail. I mean, if if I'm not okay with failing, I'm not going to tra- trail or blaze the trail that I need to blaze um, to, to to get to where I want to go. Um, but also, what has been really helpful is connecting with other people, not as mentors, but as colleagues, as associates, as an alliance to help me through those things. And uh, what what I'm talking about more specifically are the mastermind groups that I've been a part of, and we've touched on this a little bit. I'm actually a part of three different mastermind groups, each with between four and eight people, two that meet weekly, one that meets monthly, and they are integral to me and what I'm trying to do because then I can, as I'm blazing that trail, talk, talk to them about the new things that I'm trying and get a very good kind of indication of, of what they might think or what, 
where I'm going is actually going to ha- what what's what it's going to do for me in my business. I mean, I can get very honest, brutal advice and brutal accounts and opinions on what I'm doing, and that's been very very helpful because, you know, as you blaze a new trail, you might not know exactly kind of where you're going, but it's nice to know that you are maybe headed in the right direction. You know, you might steer off course this way a little bit, you might steer off course that way, but if you have other things in place like other people to help you when you steer off course to kind of be like, hey, no, no, go back over here, go back over here. No, 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 too far, too far, go, <laughs> go back over here. Like, it's hard to do that on your own because you are so focused on your own stuff and you get so deep into it. Sometimes that outside perspective is very, very important because it's hard to see the whole picture when you are in it yourself. That that's a beautiful point, and it actually goes into the next point, which is you appear to be multi-passionate. And I know that a lot of folks, when starting off, are also multi-passionate. But talk to us a bit about sort of, you know, when you're starting and you're multi-passionate versus later on after you have a foundation and then you you sort of, you know, venture into other arena, other areas, and you're, you know, doing film and, and right. doing other things, being able to do philanthropy and things like that. I mean, one of the worst things you could do to yourself and all that energy you have to do something is spread it around in too many places because what's going to happen is you aren't going to get anywhere you want to go with any of those things. Um, there, there's a great book out there called – there's two books actually in this kind of realm. Uh, the first one by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan called The One Thing, and he talks, they talk about this power of just focusing on one thing at a time and how detrimental it is to you and what you're trying to do if you focus on too many things at one time because all that energy is being spread out and nothing's going to get accomplished. And there's a really great example in this book. They call they they have this thing called the domino effect. And if you, um, th- there was actually just recently a world record. I think it was nine million dominoes were were knocked over. Somebody took the oh time to set up nine million. Oh dominoes, my! Like, and then just knock them over. <laughs> right, but you know that one domino in the beginning. That's all it took to knock down those nine million dominoes. Right. And how much energy was expanded out of that from that one little touch at the beginning. So it's not necessarily about putting more effort in, which a lot of people feel like they have to do. I need to do more of this. I need to do more of this. More, 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 more. Sometimes it's just about doing the right thing. And that might take a little bit of more research, might take connecting with the right people to find out what that first domino should be. And there's a really cool thing that they t- also talk about in the book related to the dominoes is that a domino can actually knock down a domino that is one and a half times its size. So, for instance, a two-inch domino could knock down a three-inch domino. Right. And if you keep going in that sequence, that one-inch domino can knock over after 73 dominoes, if you keep getting exponentially bigger, the one little domino that you tip over will knock over the 73rd domino, which reaches from the Earth to the moon. That's uh-huh. how big that domino would be. Obviously, that's just a hypothetical example because if a domino that big fell on the Earth, everybody would be crushed, be tidal waves, and everything would be – there's yeah. the mind of the architect and the guy who drives the DeLorean. You've got to love the geek, though. <laughs> right, but you know what I mean, right? Like, again, yeah, it's just finding that one thing that yep. you need to start out with. Yeah, um, and then, it. Right, and then there's the idea of essentialism. So keeping only those things that are incredibly essential for what it is that you're trying to do. Because a lot of us, we stay busy, and we feel like we're getting things done, but we're busy doing the things that we don't need to do. We're just doing the things that we're comfortable doing. And it makes us feel like we're getting somewhere, and then we wonder why we're getting nowhere. It's because we're not actually doing the things that are essential to helping us progress. We're just doing things that feel like they're making us busy. Well, to that to that point, you know, you seem to be doing more, but yet you say you have more time with your family. Yeah. So talk to us about that. How are you achieving that? What are you doing? Well, it's about – Make that possible. Yeah, well, it's understanding about – Okay, how do how, when do I do those things? So I'm doing a lot more for my business, but it's not trading time for my family. It's just adding on time somewhere else. It's optimizing time that I spend doing things. It's leveraging systems, for example, software that could do things for me that I don't have to do myself anymore, or other team members, you know, other people who do things that I used to do. For instance, I edited the first four years of the Smart Passive Income podcast all on my own. I did all of the graphics all on my own. Why? Because it was my thing. It was my baby. I didn't want anybody else to touch it. I didn't think anybody else could do it in that way that I needed it to be done. So I did it myself. Just recently, because Chris Ducker has been hounding me on this for years, he's like, you need to get somebody to do that for you. You have more important things to do in your business. I was like, no, no, no. This is my thing. I don't think anybody could do it in the way I wanted to. It's my baby, my baby, my baby. Well, recently I decided to give it a shot and test out what it was like to outsource or have somebody else on my team edit my podcast for me to do everything from 
you know, the slicing and dicing of the final uh, edits of the show to the show notes, to the tagging, to the uploading, to the to everything. Now I just go in, read the final draft, tweak it a few times if I need to, hit publish. I wake up every Wednesday, it's there, boom, publish, that's it, it's done. It's a beautiful thing. I've been able to save about five hours a week doing that. Over the that's course huge. of a whole – over the, it's absolutely huge. And it's like, oh, it's just five hours, but five uh-huh. hours over the course of 52 – uh, 52 uh, weeks Week. is like 260 um, hours. Like imagine what you could do in 260 hours. You can create a whole other business. You could uh, do charity work, all this other stuff. So I focus on not just when I'm doing things but how and optimizing those things as well. Now in terms of when, you know, like I said, the family is the top priority for me. So I actually don't work when my family is awake. Right now they're actually napping. My, mom, my uh, wife is awake though, but my kids are napping right now. They probably be waking up very soon though um, as we finish up. But uh, I do most of my work at night, either at night after they go to sleep. So I work for a couple hours between 9 and 11. And then I get ready for bed, hang out with my wife for a little bit, typically go to bed around midnight. And then I usually wake up around uh, 5.30 or 6 and I get an hour or two of work done in the morning before the kids wake up. And so that's how I've been sort of time hacking. And because I, I could spend eight hours during the day working, but then I'd be interrupted by my kids. I'd be wanting to spend time with them, and I wouldn't get anything done, whereas I can just chunk everything down into optimized hours in those certain times of the day. That's, that's brilliant. And I do have one more question for you, but i got to do this plug because Julie Sharanosha, who is the time hacker extraordinaire. Oh, I love Julie. With her. I love Julie. You have to um, check out episode number two, I think, of the Her Power Hustle podcast. I'll put a link to it in the show notes for this, herpowerhustle.com slash Pat Flynn as well, because she does not play when it comes to time hacking and productivity, and Pat is right on. I can't let you get off the phone without asking you about fear. Um, like I said at the top, you're very transparent. You're transparent in putting it up your income reports. People can see that you make six figures on average per month, and they can see where it's coming from, et cetera. But talk to us about your fear because you've, been, you've freed me very much by being very open about your fear in the past and how you've dealt with public speaking. Mm-hmm. And so talk to us about that. I mean, we talked about the fear and taking a risk with Jason and Jeremy and, and investing in yourself financially. But talk to us about overcoming that so that you could further your brand or what yeah. was the impetus for taking that first public <laughs> Oh, gosh. You know, thing at New, I think it was New Media Expo was your first one, right? Um, no, not quite almost, though. My first speaking gig was uh, October 2011 in Chicago at the Financial Blogger Conference. Right, right, Financial Bloggers. Right, right. And I always knew I was – I was supposed to speak on stage. It was a great way to build your brand and, and have authority in, in, a, in a particular space. It's a great way to, you know, obviously go to a conference because people see you as a speaker there and, and, and people see you on the stage and that's great. Um, it's a great way to deliver a message directly to people to have them and make an impact on people as well. Um, but I was scared to death from it. I, I would never have imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Um, but I remember back then, you know, my I, I've always, I knew for like a year that I was supposed to do it. Everybody who I knew was speaking at New Media Expo. I had actually been asked to speak at other events before. But then my good friend Philip Taylor, who is the founder and director of the Financial Blogger Conference, he ran a blog at ptmoney.com in the financial blogging uh, space. And he was somebody who I really respected, and he asked me to speak. And because he asked me and I was a follower of his and I knew what he was doing and this was the first time he was putting on his event, I wanted to help him out. And I was like, okay, th- this is – okay, I'm going to do it. And uh, he was like, okay, you're going to speak for 20 minutes sometime in the middle. Um, you know, you'll probably have like 50 people there, so just to let you know. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Like I'll come up with something great. Uh, and, and then um, about two days before I was going to travel to Chicago, he calls me up and he goes, Pat. The closing speaker isn't available. He can't make it. Can you fill in for him? And I was like, uh, he's like, you'll be speaking probably in front of about 300 or 400 people. Right. Like, from 20 to 30 people to, you know. Right. And, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> like, I just wanted to close, like, run away. Um, but I was like, you know what? Like, I got to do this. When I started my podcast, I feared it, but I crushed it. And now it's doing well for me. When I started my YouTube channel, same thing. This is a sign that this is what I have to do. And so I did it. And then I ended up, to prepare myself for this presentation, I spent – I spent so many hours scripting the whole darn thing. Like I wrote out every single word that I was going to say, and I memorized it. I was that fearful and not reliant on my skills. I was just so like, what if I lose my place? You know, I I memorized everything. And it went okay. It did well. It was 
not as robotic as you might have thought, and I did do a lot of things wrong. It was recorded, and I watched it afterwards, and I was just cringing a lot of the times. But the cool thing was a lot of people came up to me afterwards like, Pat, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that was your first time speaking. You were a natural, and I'm like, were you watching the same presentation? Right, I was right, exactly. <laughs> you know, I was like, what? And, and to hear that was really cool. So what, what that taught me was it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what my audience thinks. It matters the impact that I can have on my audience. It matters not me, but them. And, and that's been driving, a driving force behind me and my brand for a very long time now. And then you know, over the years, I've done more and more and bigger and bigger presentations, and I've always tried to learn more. I've, I've actually hired coaches to help me. Um, I hired a magician once to help me because I had mm-hmm. magic in a presentation mm-hmm. um, and, and all these other things. And this recent one I did at New Media Expo, which is sort of the culmination of my speaking careers uh, for, at this point, which is the opening keynote at New Media Expo. Um, which is huge. I wanted to go big, uh-huh. and, and so I did this thing with you the DeLorean, did. and I don't know if you wanted to link to that presentation, but it's up there. Oh, on I'm YouTube. definitely linking to it. Absolutely. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Absolutely. So that's, that's um, my uh, my timeline, I guess you could say, as, uh, from a public speaking standpoint. I, I still get scared. I still want to throw up before I go on stage, okay. Okay, uh, which is – yeah. yeah, I mean I, I still get nervous, but I, w- I feel like if I didn't get nervous – that's when I should really be nervous because then it means it's, it's not it's something that's meaningful to me anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's perfect. I, I love that. And so to people who come to you and ask you for advice when they have to do something that they're afraid of, um, now I'm asking you as my mentor. Video. I hate video. I'm afraid <laughs> of video. I don't like doing video. So what are your words of wisdom to me and all of our listeners right now who have to do something that they don't like to do or afraid to do? That would be Sure. Well, let me ask you, why do you don't want, why do you not like video? I think for me, it just feels like I look funny, um, that it's just a little too close, um, Mm -hmm. that, you Mm -hmm. know, you have to do the hair and the makeup. I think guys are a bit easier. I just feel like there's a presentation because this will be captured, you know, for time. And so I don't want to look schleppy. Right. Well, there's one thing you could do because I had the exact same fear, um, of what I look like on camera. And obviously since then I've, gotten over that because i'm like in every single video now um (laughs) but that's obviously i mean that's important because from a brand standpoint if you are your own brand you need to be on camera i mean it's just you have to do that to build that true relationship but when you're first starting out with video you could still be completely helpful you could still build a big relationship with your audience by doing screencasts and that's sort of a happy medium between um podcasting on a video essentially while showing or teaching something that's on a computer screen, you know, recording what you're doing on your screen and actually sharing that while speaking over it without showing your voice or excuse me, without showing your face. And that's, that's where I would start. That's where I started. I did about, I don't know, a dozen of those before I finally got comfortable and I put my face on camera once and then worrying, I was going to get people saying like, Oh my gosh, like you're, you don't belong to camera. Like you, you have a face made for radio or whatever, uh, or whatever they say. Uh, and then, you know, nobody has said anything. Nobody has said anything. I had the same fears of my podcast, too, with my voice, like so worried about what people would say about my voice. The only person who has said anything negative about my voice is myself. Right. And again. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was getting ready to say, you know, even having this conversation, Pat, I've been listening to you for years. And so this is very comfortable to me. Your voice is a voice that many of us are very comfortable having in our ears. And so, you know, I love that you, you took something that you were afraid of and now look at the intimacy you've created with people all over the world. Thank you. So I know our time is running short. I have one final question for you, but I'm going to put that off. I'd like you to give our listeners sort of as they can tell from this conversation, you are a wealth of knowledge. For anyone who is not already listening to Pat's podcast, any of his podcasts, um, you should. And they all have a different flavor and a different feel, so I would suggest that you listen to all of them and see which ones, if not all, that really resonate with you. Um, Ask Pat is awesome. He answers questions from um, the audience. He gives great advice. He's helped me loads with the Her Power Hustle community, and I know that his fingerprint is on a lot of podcasts and on a lot of businesses out there right now. So, Pat, we thank you for that as a community collective. Thank Um, you. So what are some final words that you have for women entrepreneurs that various stages along the journey, many of whom are sidepreneurs. What are some thoughts about sort of this journey that that is ahead of them that you would like to impart? Yeah, I mean, no matter what stage you're at, no matter how big your business is, or even if you're just getting started, you have to realize that the failure that you're going to experience is just a part of the journey. Failing is not bad. We are grown up to feel like failing is bad. 
you know, getting an F in school, you're, you get grounded for it and all that stuff. Like failing is good. Like I want to fail as many times as I can. You know why? Because every time I fail, when I learn from my failures, I know I'm getting one step closer each time to that thing that I'm shooting for. Failure is a part of the journey. It's a part it's it, it, it's it's a it's part of the ritual of being an entrepreneur. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. It's about trying to figure things out after you fail and knowing that ahead of time is going to be so reassuring for those of you who who have fear because if you feel great, learn from it, keep falling forward because when you keep falling forward, you're going to eventually keep getting back up and eventually get to that place where you need to go. Pat, I so love that you brought this right back to the journey. We started with the road less traveled, and now we talk about sort of failure along the journey, along the way. Thank you so much. Where can people find you? And we'll have links to everything, of course, in the show notes. But do you have a preferred place for people to go, that one-stop shop for Pat Flynn, all things Pat Flynn? Yeah, I mean, uh, smartpassiveincome.com would probably be the best place. I'm connected everywhere that I'm doing is connected there, uh, and, and at Pat Flynn on Twitter. Perfect. So here's our final question, Mr. Flynn, and then I'm going to let you go so you can maybe have a cup of water before the kids wake up. <laughs> what is your favorite song or movie about romance or love, romantic love or platonic love, song Ooh. or movie? Song or movie. And now here's today's Power Boost from Stacy Ferguson of Blogalicious. It's Justice Fergie from Blogalicious, and I can't wait to see you all at our 7th annual Blogalicious Weekend Conference this September 10th through 12th at the Baltimore Inner Harbor. We're going to be at the Marriott Baltimore Waterfront, and we are going to have three amazing days of content connections and information, all helping you to build your own empire. Our hashtag is BYOE15, and we can't wait to see you there. Find out more at bblogalicious.com. Thanks, Stacy. I'll see you in September. And now back to our conversation with Pat Flynn. Song Ooh. or movie? Song or movie? Um, I have to say Peter Cetera, Glory of Love. And and I only say that because it's a, it's, it's me and my wife's song. And, oh, and if you look up uh, on YouTube, um, Wedding Dance, Surprise, Glory of Love, you will see a video of me and my wife dancing at our wedding and in the wow. middle of Peter Cetera, Glory of Love, the DJ messes up or he acts like he messes up. And then we break out into a hip hop dance routine that my, <laughs> that my wife choreographed because she was a hip hop dancer in college. I love it. <laughs> Only you, Pat. I love that. <laughs> I love that. This is the perfect question for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, I give my wife credit for that one because she choreographed it uh, well, the night before, along. actually. And you, did you have fear for that now? What oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, oh, like yeah. dancing in front of everybody in a white right. tux um, with there's like a hat toss in the middle of it, too. Like that could have failed. But you know what? We had fun and uh, we supported each other. So so we got through it. Pat Flynn, I really appreciate it. It sounds fun. I can't. I'm going to go. I'm Googling that right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciated this conversation. I know that you've really enriched our community and I look forward to seeing you in July. All right. I'll see you in July. All right. Take care, Pat. Thanks, everybody. So I really hope you got some value from that conversation. Um, if you head over to the show notes, they are located at herpowerhustle.com slash Pat Flynn, P-A-T-F-L-Y-N-N, herpowerhustle.com slash Pat Flynn. And you can get links to the um, information that he shared as well as, yes, I did put up the dancing wedding video um, as well as, uh, and I didn't know that Pat could pop and lock. I'm telling you, it's a sight to behold. A lot of fun. I have to say that he is definitely someone who will push the boundaries of the envelope to, as you heard him say, he knew that he needed to do public speaking. And yeah, he still feels like puking every time, but he does it and he does it afraid. And that reminds me of one of our super power hustle, um, super sister power hustlers, uh, Kaywanda Lamb, who is all about doing it anyway and doing it afraid. And you'll hear more from her. I know we're going to have, um, you know, an ad from her coming up really soon so you can learn more about her work with single moms. I wanted to just say that, you know, 
that conversation with Pat, for many of you who are listening, you know that Pat is someone who um, doesn't give interviews uh, readily. He is very, very guarded of his time, as well he should be, which he actually alluded to in terms of our conversation and the importance of time and time with his family. And so our communications actually began about a year ago. And I just reached out to him and shared with him how our paths had uh, intersected almost, right? Um, How he had uh, taken the road less traveled and I admired him for that. And that at some point in the future, I would love to have an opportunity to chat with him about that choice. And then I didn't reach out to him again for probably another six or seven, eight months and touch base with him again. And at that point, we began the process of um, scheduling the conversation that you just listened to. I say that to say two things. One is that we can always reach out to folks because they're people just like us, even if they seem that they're in a higher position or they're further along or farther along in their journey than we are. And we might question what value do we have to add. There is no harm in asking for an interview and, and telling someone how they've impacted your life or, you know, letting them know that the work that they're doing is valuable to you. Another takeaway that I have from that conversation is the investment, financial investment that he made into his professional development at a point where I did not. And there's two lessons that I've learned there. One is that if you hear what he said, he said they gave away so much content, I almost felt like um, I would feel badly if I didn't pay them for all of the great content that they had given me for free, which happens a lot in our society because you can learn things on YouTube and podcasts and reading magazines that are online for free or other um, ways to, to consume content in a free space that people are creating. I mean, it's time, it's energy, it's resources, it's, it's, it's intellectual property that people are sharing for free with the hopes in some cases that there'll be an opportunity for the listener or the consumer to turn into an actual physical buyer. And if you think about it, Pat had a really good attitude about that. And he said, hey, these guys have been giving me so much for free. I felt obligated to pay them because they'd given me so much for free. The other argument that I've heard about that is that, hey, I've given so much great information away for free. I can only imagine how much greater the information is when you're paying for it, which is also oftentimes true. But also the mindset of number one saying, I'm going to invest and this is an investment. So therefore, there should be an expectation of return on this investment. And then number two to say, this is the type of consumer I am, and I hope that I attract consumers like that myself. And this is a piece I just want to take a moment to share with those of you who are, um, you know, really launching your businesses or maybe struggling finding customers or paying customers or paying clients, and that is sometimes to look within. I was stingy. Let's just be honest. I was stingy and afraid, and therefore, how can I attract And open myself up to attracting paying clients myself when I am in a constricted and my fist is closed. If I'm in a place where I can't give, how can I receive? You know, so I just wanted to take that moment to just share that with you. That's just a little nugget. And then we're going to go ahead and go about our day. But I wanted to say again, thank you so much for joining. This was a great episode for me to record. I had a great time speaking with Pat. I've had a great time speaking with you. Please, I look forward to seeing you in our exclusive Facebook group, HerPowerHustle.com slash winning. So you can join the group and have an opportunity to win all of those great prizes and products. And I look forward to seeing you next week with my laptop up and running. As we say, her hustle is real. Take care.